Okay, so in the interest of time here, so we might have a few more people joining us a bit later, but I think, uh, Peng, I think, we, I think we'll get started now, yeah. if that's okay with you. So, Lei, uh, welcome. Um, like I said, yeah, so we might have a few more people joining us, but I think uh, in the interest of time, I think uh, just to be respectful of Peng's time, uh, we'll start the present presentation now. So just to introduce myself here. Uh, so my name is Dennis Sussick. I'm the chair of the computer chapter. Welcome to our November uh, 2022 technical event. Um, very happy here to have my colleague Peng Dai from Huawei uh, presenting our technical presentation this evening. He's uh, my colleague here in the computer chapter in Toronto, joined us, um, I believe, middle of 2021. And uh, he's uh, working with us to help organize events for the computer chapter in Toronto. And uh, he's agreed to give us a technical presentation in his area of expertise. And it's going to be a very interesting presentation. And uh, yeah, so I'll just, uh, I guess as far as questions, there's not really a lot of us on the call here. So uh, Leigh, if you have a question, please uh, feel free to just unmute yourself and ask uh, Peng uh, any questions. And um this presentation should be about 30 minutes. And like I said, we may have a few more people uh, uh, coming on the call. So um, I'll just, uh, Peng, take it away. Yep. And thank you again for doing this. Yes. So maybe I will just uh, start. No. Okay. Can you guys see the screen, the correct one? Yes. Ah, yes. Okay. Yes. So I'll just uh, proceed. So hello everyone. So I'm very glad to be here to share my experience in deep learning. Uh, today my topic is opportunities in deep learning. So I will mainly focus on the commercialization and career path side of this topic. Uh, here is the outline. Uh, first, uh, I will give uh, a brief introduction of uh, what is deep learning from a practical point of view. After that, we'll, be, we'll talk something about uh, how does uh, deep learning help to make a profit. If you are going to into the industries, I think how to make a profit is a key question that you need to think about. And uh, finally, let's uh, talk how to become an AI scientist, basically how to come into this career. And uh, we have been hearing about the concept of uh, artificial intelligence and deep learning everywhere. Let's say in the movies, in the news, even in government reports. But what is deep learning? And what can you do? Is it just like in the movies, the Terminator? Or is it just uh, the Jarvis from Iron Man? And just uh, kidding with those examples. Uh, at least part of the concept, contents in those uh, science fiction movies have always been the goal of deep learning research. Uh, according to uh, Oxford English Dictionary, artificial intelligence is uh, the, 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 uh, the intelligence demonstrated by machines, including but not limited to perceiving, synthesizing, and inferring information. Deep learning is one of the most successful algorithms in AI. In simple words, deep learning roughly belongs to artificial neural network, but bigger and the better. So after years of uh, fast development, Deep learning can achieve human level performance on a wide range of well-defined tasks. So by well-defined tasks, I mean those who have a clear input-output definition. For example, for image classification, the input will be an image. The so output will be the name of the object in this image. For object detection, again, the input will be an image. The output will be uh, the, uh, the name of the object together with the location where that object is in this image. Also for video description, the input will be the video, the output will be the sentence describing what's happening. For video QA, it will be video plus a question, the output will be the uh, sentence answering that question. So another important thing I want to mention here is the reinforcement learning. I think some of the, you, you guys may heard about AlphaGo, it was uh, AI designed by DeepMind, and uh, AlphaGo managed to defeat a human Go chess world champion in 2016. It was really shocking at that time. So people started to discuss if AI is better than human in a lot of things. It's kind of, let's say, 
very strange discussions. Reinforced learning here try to generate the optimum strategy based on the environment output. In this go test particular case, the AI will respond to the human's moves and then predict the best strategy. Actually, one step forward, AI can also generate realistic images and views. So we can consider it as the creation. Along this topic, uh, diffusion models and the neural rendering has become the, two of the most popular tasks in this uh, domain. The images on the uh, uh, bottom left corner are generated by diffusion models via text prompt. The uh, AI code, uh, the AI model creates a new painting based on its understanding of the text input. And for the GIF on the, that is flashing on the upper right corner, the AI system will take 2D images of the environment and generate a realistic virtual world so that we can navigate freely in it. And how cool is that? Actually, that's very cool if you try the real code. So basically you can freely go wherever direction you basically control the camera. So you, you may notice that some of those photos and examples I referenced here that belong to NVIDIA, some of belong to Apple, that means that some of the algorithms has already been commercialized. Now let's talk a little bit about history. So, so to have a better understanding of uh, the roughly what those algorithms are doing. So I'm from computer region background. So here I only gave a brief summary of the common algorithms in vision. So in this slide, the algorithms are far from complete. Just only serve as a high level abstraction based on my personal experience. Perhaps deep learning become to gain fame when AlexNet won the ImageNet image classification challenge. So after that, a wide range of uh, CNNs were proposed, including the ImpressionNet series, ResNet, ResNext, and ImpressionNet series more recently by adding the AutoML. Uh, in the past few years, vision transformers gradually caught up and started to dominate classical vision tasks like uh, classification and you know, detection things. So, however, it doesn't mean that is the end of CNNs. With the proper hyperparameter tuning, CNNs still can, can achieve equal better results uh, as compared to the VITs. Let's uh, talk a little bit more about uh, vision transformers. Since it's probably the most commonly used backbone structure for recent computer vision research, uh, transformers were originally designed for sequence tasks like uh, natural language processing. Basically, it means the input has to be a sequence. It cannot be just a 2D image. So it was published in a NIPS paper called Attention is All You Need. Actually, this uh, title is uh, very ambitious. It's just saying you only need to do attention to achieve the dance task. From the region researchers adapted the algorithm to region tasks as shown in this video, the image input is transformed into a sequence of patches, then become a sequence problem. Then those patches went through the multi-headed attention module together with a, a classification head or, or other head for the downstream task. With this simple structure, the model was able to beat a lot of the state-of-the-art uh, CNNs. Then we come right. to this. Hang, I have a question. Can you go back to the previous slide? Yep. So what is what is the what is okay? What is this transform? Uh, what is the uh, what is the transformation being done? And the result is it says at the end here of the animation. Mm -hmm. I guess I should be listening to you rather than watching the screen here. But it says <laughs> ML, MLP head class bird call. What is that? So it's a, is it feature extraction? What what is this uh, transformation doing? So basically, uh, I say it's a transformer encoder transforms those uh, patches, these little cubes, into a feature embedding. So this feature embedding will be connected to a classification head, then to be adapted to the downstream task. For example, if uh, this is a classification problem, usually that, that will be uh, a few multi-layer perceptrons, basically fully connected layers to match the dimension. Then have a soft max to get uh, the to get the uh, soft max to get 
the, the decision. So here okay, so you're basically it, doing embedding. So it transforms the input into an intermediary uh, format for subsequent so class, for, su yeah. for subsequent tasks, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So yeah, transformer was very very efficient and uh, achieved basically dominated uh, the major let's say state of the art on a lot of vision tasks. Then we can we come to this question: Why does transformer work? Is uh, basically a transformer in terms of uh, depth. Basically, because deep learning is called deep because it so have so many layers. Transformers literally doesn't have that many layers. So why does it work that way? So the success of uh, VIT mainly gave credit to the appearance of uh, large data sets. Uh, based on my personal experience, uh, transformers can benefit from large data sets much more easily. It requires less individual personal skills to achieve high accuracy. On the other hand, uh, CNNs will demand much more effort and expertise to achieve the same level of performance, which means that uh, the same model trained by an experienced researcher may be much better than the same model trained by a new guy. So this, this makes transfer much more friendly for new researchers. And this also makes uh, commercialization of transfer much easier. So because you don't need to give uh, such advanced training for the new employees. Hmm. Uh, now that we've talked about uh, large scale data sets, there's one important po point that uh, I haven't mentioned here. High quality, large data sets are very difficult and expensive to create. So that's why self-supervised learning become very popular. With the self-supervised learning, uh, it makes uh, the, it possible to train a model without a large amount of manual labeled uh, data set. So basically you need uh, a large amount of unlabeled data set together with a small amount of labeled data. So the model will first do uh, efficient pre-train on those uh, large amounts of data, and then do a fine tune on that small data set. You know, just collecting image or videos are very easy if you don't need to label it. Just download from the internet, and this uh, process can significantly reduce the cost of for model development. So if uh, for someone, if you actually know the cost of uh, let's say operating such a uh, pipeline, you know that you, you they need to pay a lot of money for people to label the data. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. So here is uh, some work from my team. So we have been actively working in all major areas of communication, including self cellular learning, future learning, multimodal diffusion, action recognition, localization. Deep learning helped to significantly improve the performance of uh, machine learning systems and open the door for practical application. The algorithms I listed here are mostly uh, applied to real products. Any questions so far? Or can I move to the uh, products part? Yeah, okay. Then I will just uh, continue. Mm -hmm. uh, now let's talk about how AI helped to make a profit. So market value is a key for us to survive in this difficult time of uh, economic uncertainty. So I'm going to talk about uh, this topic from my personal experience. It's not intended to be general. I have uh, been working in video understanding for more than 10 years. In my personal opinion, the most successful application of deep learning models of innovation in product is classification and retrieval. To be more specific, so the multimedia search is to search image by image or search video by image. Both Google and Huawei provide this kind of service. We can also take it one step forward, that is to search inside a video to find when a particular action or content happens. Okay. And then with those AI capability, it is also possible to locate the exciting moment of a video. Sports highlights is a perfect example of such application. So finally, for our video streaming service, the service providers usually need uh, to have a large amount of metadata to give a good recommendation. So that will include the classification of videos into different uh, precise categories. 
Those are all examples of AI-powered products. I will select several of those to talk into detail to see where that AI is helping. Uh, let's just uh, go to some details of the product. The first one is Spotlight Reel. It is a product that my team developed. Uh, let's uh, consider such a scenario. So I take my kid to a birthday party and shoot a video there. Now, usually for kids' birthday party, it's usually uh, very crowded. So inevitably, my video will have a lot of people in it. If I'm going to show off this video to my friends, what I really want to show is the part of the video with my kid in it. So Spotlight Reel will help me to achieve this exactly what I want. So the, the app will scan the whole video and do face detection, tracking, clustering, and classification. Of course, with the user's permission, they can do classification. Otherwise, we will do just a unsupervised clustering. And then we'll give the user the option of play the, only the part with a particular person in it. You can see the technology behind this just includes detecting the face, that's face detection, and extract the feature embeddings, that's face recognition, and then the unsupervised customer. So those algorithms itself doesn't make money, but you have put it into a product. So this product was a big success. It was featured in one of uh, Huawei new product release conference. What so, kind of what kind of hardware uh, what kind of hardware uh, do you need to run this uh, in a reasonable amount of time? Is there special uh, standard CPUs or digital signal processing chips or what type of hardware? I, I guess everything can be in software, but I assume this runs with dedicated yeah. hardware. Yeah. So the algorithm itself can be adapted to different hardware, but for this, because you do a Huawei phone. So Huawei phone has uh, this uh, AI chip. I think Apple also has the AI chip. All the, all the major brand, uh, let's say a smartphone has the AI chip that can accelerate the computation. So although you know, the CPU is usually faster than those AI chip, but a CPU, you can't take the power of CPU as a way because it has to handle other stuff. So there, there is a dedicated, let's say low end, let's say AI chip in the phone. So basically, the app will call that chip to do the basically mainly to save energy. Yeah. Okay. okay. The next one I want to mention here is the sports highlights. So World Cup is going on now. So usually a soccer match will take uh, ninety minutes to two hours depending on the situation. So for a soccer fan, this is great. You have a lot of video to enjoy. But for someone who's not that interested in soccer, that will be just two hours of boring ball passing. So our system here can help scan the video and fi find the exciting part. For soccer, that will be the goal, uh, goal moment, I say, because everyone can understand what that is. So I gave the user the option of jumping directly to that time step. So another example given in this slide is a boxing match. Maybe someone is not that that's interested in boxing, so our system can scan the video and uh, find the exciting moment. Here we consider the knockdown as the exciting moment. Basically, the, the system can give the user the option of jumping directly to that part. So the technology behind this function would include the action recognition and action localization. Basically, we are localizing the particular action of interest. The next one would be the catalyst store. I think this concept has been there for some time. I think companies like uh, Amazon and uh, Walmart have, has already opened such stores in the US. The assumed situation is like this, the customer walk into the store, take what he wants and just leave without interacting with the cashier. How do we, a system like, how do we design a system like this? The system need to detect and track the customer while he's in the store. And then the system need to classify which product uh, the customer took and retrieve the price information. Finally, when the customer leaves, the system need to automatically build the total price. 
So algorithms involved in this whole process would include, but not limited to, object detection, tracking, both object tracking and uh, person tracking, image classification, OCR, information issue, et cetera, et cetera. Because the, the customer will walk freely in the store, there will be a lot of occlusion. And sometimes you can only see the person, sometimes you can only see the product. And then this will be a very complex system. But since the store is already in operation, this the whole system is uh, actually in oper it's, uh, working. So that's a real product. Here are some more example of AI power product fashion search by taking a photo from Google. Basically take a picture, the Google will find the product for you, the price, the store. This is a cross modality trio problem. Also the immersive map from Google map. I think the, uh, you see announced this function. I don't see it on my Google map, but it's already announced this function. Uh, this product will use uh, the newer rendering algorithm and give the user uh, more freedom of viewing the destination. I pull cutout is an example of uh, uh, semantic segmentation. I think this is a new feature in the most recent uh, iOS update. Face ID is face recognition. They need to verify if this is the correct user. Uh, the, the technology behind it is just uh, finding the face uh, landmark and do the matching. So any questions so far? Or do we just uh, go to the career path? <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. So uh, I have to spend the past about uh, 20 minutes is explaining how promising this area is. Now let's talk about the career path and how to get into this area. And now that we've come to this topic, I have to spend some time on this recent event. A lot of uh, big companies are laying off employees, including AI scientists. Does this mean this is the end of uh, the good time? So personally, I'm quite optimistic about the situation. Uh, it is true that laying off uh, 10,000 employees is very scary. So we, but we also have to consider the fact that big tech companies like Amazon just went through the largest hiring process during the pandemic. They need some time to digest, especially when the economy situation has changed. You know, in the past uh, two years, everybody stay home. So all they can do is only shop online. Of course, Amazon is uh, making a good, uh, let's say, revenue. But right now, everybody, everything going back to normal. So people may prefer to do in-person shopping. So things change. So they also have to change. So AI itself can bring significant amount of revenue like we just mentioned in the second section. So a lot of that can really improve the user experience of products. At the product level, there are still a number of well-defined problems uh, still handled by human. So potential is still there. So more importantly, so some companies are still hiring. So we are one of those. We are hiring constantly. Uh, let's uh, move a little bit deeper to the role. The job title is usually a scientist or applied scientist. According to Glassdoor, you can just Google it. The average salary is about 11,000. Uh, for qualified PhDs, you will surely get way more than that, I assure you, because I have been overseeing hiring in my, in my team for a long time. So, so income-wise, this should be a pretty decent role for fresh graduates. To become an AI scientist, a, a typical career path is something like this. An internship in the industries is a good start. For example, my, peer, uh, my team hires interns at all levels, including undergrads, masters, and PhDs. Fresh PhD graduates usually start as uh, a scientist. Detail rank will be decided by experience and achievements. For example, publications in top conferences are considered as strong asset. The next level would be senior scientist or staff scientist. Usually those people will lead a small team and may independently manage a product. Finally, that's a principal scientist or other higher level management role. Those people will usually 
you know, manage multiple scientists and manage multiple products, more like on the management side. Another important thing I have to mention here is that uh, at all levels, there is uh, an option of going back to academic. Of course, this is a, a case by case basis. Uh, as AI scientists, you will continue to publish papers in top AI conferences and journals. This is uh, kind of overlapping with uh, requirements for academia. So some people choose to be a professor after spending some time in the industries. Maybe they feel that if there is a better work-life balance, because in the companies you have to design, dedicate your time for the, let's say, the rhythm of the product. For example, there may be a deadline in one week. You have to do it. Otherwise, there is a big problem. Maybe in, people will think in academia, you will have well, say, more freedom to do the research that you personally prefer. When you said that, so uh, PhD in computer science, what's the yeah. what's the, dis the discipline? Is it computer science or mathematics or? Uh, usually for, because I'm more on the vision side, so we favor computer science because, and especially we are delivering some of the, our product directly to the smartphone. So in that case, the coding requirements is much higher than pure research. But for those we have, they have to have coding and the publication. Usually they are more than qualified for the, uh, usually if the, the average level of uh, academia. So here I give some sample job posts found online. You can see that uh, the requirements usually include a graduate degree, relevant experience, coding, and the publication in top AI conferences. So the way to get yourself ready for this kind of career is uh, relatively clear. I divide the requirements uh, into two broad categories. The first one would be the technical skills. The second one is soft skills. Along technical skills, education, coding, and publication are the three major aspects. Uh, as we mentioned, because those are kind of, uh, let's say, the product I mentioned in prior section include a lot of uh, training of deep learning models. In order to have a proper skill on that, you probably need a, a PhD, especially some of the posts that require publication in public conference and journals. That's usually the requirements of a PhD graduation. So of course, some really, really good master's students also have publications. Uh, PhD will have its advantage. But on the coding side, uh, I think the master's student will have more advantage. I say, because usually when people do research for a long time, they will be more comfortable with Python than for the front end or C++ level coding, they will forget, almost forget. So again, this is uh, as a whole combination. So, but the most important part is that it's better that you prepare yourself for all three of them. None of them are kind of missing. Also, uh, for particular roles, there may be different uh, particular requirements. For example, if you are applying for an NLP scientist role, probably they will require you to have a decent understanding of NLU. But for vision, probably we will require you to have some decent understanding of uh, low-level image processing. But those, roughly, you can learn from your graduate courses. Also, you need to prepare for the interview. Different companies have their different patterns for interview. For example, for Amazon, if you, before you go to the interview, you probably want to have a good study of their 22 leadership principles. I think that 22, the best thing always increase. So you have to prepare yourself for those culture. So basically your, pro, your performance will be strongly affected by whether or not you align with their culture. For soft, soft skills, I think the most important part is that uh, is better uh, you have first have to analyze yourself to see if this is something you really like, <laughs> because we are talking about a lifelong career. So if this is something you really hate, I don't believe you can do it for, for a living. So first, you, you can persuade yourself that this is something you can do for a living. And then 
you need to uh, do some networking with people from similar areas. In this way, you can have a better understanding of the, uh, the recent trend. For example, maybe five years ago, for computer vision interviews, everybody will ask about uh, CNNs. But recently, transformers are basically dominating the practical application. So the interview question, at least the technical interview questions, will be more resolved around the, the VITs. So if you prepare only the CNNs, this will be a problem. Also, uh, you, it's better that uh, if you could identify and follow top employers and know someone from the company and they are willing to give you internal referrals, that will be a strong, strong benefit because interview process is short. So we can't tell if you are faking it or you are really good at preparing for the interview. Is this your real performance? But uh, usually we trust our internal referral because he's already in here. So if he's referring someone not so good, so there will be a problem. So internal referral will be a strong aspect that you want to consider. In, uh, I assume IEEE is, uh, has got a, a several, or there's a, you know, deep learning is certainly within the IEEE uh, yep. scope of technology, right? And technical yes, practice. Yes. Um, and so students who are interested in a career, obviously, this is one of the reasons we we always promote IEEE is that it's great for networking and uh, yes. sort of finding finding contacts like yourself, right? Like to, yes. to uh, bounce ideas off of and, uh, you know, people that work in industry. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other, so you mentioned there's a lot of publications that are uh, used to publish results and new research and deep learning. Are there other technical societies in other than IEEE that are really something that students should be looking at uh, be becoming members of? So I think it'd be more, let's say, cost effective to follow the, the I mean, Google gave a ranking of the top AI conferences. You just follow those conferences. And uh, I think the one of the benefits of being in Canada is that uh, Lots of those conferences, they like to be in Canada. <laughs> so I remember the NIPS has been in Montreal for, let's say, two or three consecutive years. So some, also on the Vancouver, the, I think there they have the CGraph conference. All, a lot of those top AI conferences, they, they prefer to be in Canada. So if you have a chance to just, uh, let's say, have a workshop paper and attend those conferences, and go get to talk with the people that would be great. Also, it's like uh, we, I think uh, companies, all companies, all the big companies, they will have a hiring session in those, um, uh, let's say, conferences. I remember we uh, last year we have uh, we we sponsored the SCCV conference. I think I, I, I don't remember if SCCV is actually or CPR is actually, but one of those are, uh, top companies is actually. So we basically have an uh, entire booth to just uh, receiving resumes. If it's possible, it would be quite, uh, let's say, beneficial to attend those conferences. I think uh, that's it. So any questions about uh, the career side? Lei, uh, you can unmute yourself if you have any questions for uh, Peng. Uh, actually, I don't have a question, but um, I mean, it seems this uh, career is uh, it's very, it's really well, because I have a little bit experience in the, I was thinking, uh, AI, yeah, I have a like really small project of uh, the, yeah, one of the machine learning project, I forget the name of it. Mm -hmm. And it's quite interesting one. I'm just wondering like how, I mean, how variety of uh, knowledge that I can enjoy in this uh, industry as an internship, if I want to like get in this industry as an intern. 
Okay, so actually, that's uh, you are get you got the right person to ask. Okay, so <laughs> right now, so I kind mm -hmm. of overseeing the hiring process of my team. So uh, may I ask, let's say, are you still, which university are you at? I'm I'm in Concordia. It's a Montreal. So yeah, oh, so yes. I'm a so software mm -hmm. software engineering. I mean, I'm a, I'm a software engineer, but I have some course on, on the AI side. It's a machine learning and deep learning stuff. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So like I mentioned, so we are hiring mm -hmm. so from uh, my team. So we are hiring from all levels. Basically, mm -hmm. uh, software engineering is uh, closely related to computer science. So yep. it's basically that we consider it as a related uh, major. So for undergrad, masters, and PhDs, we are hiring interns at all levels. Oh. But uh, the, I mean, the, the expectation are a little bit different. For example, mm -hmm. for undergrads, we will focus more on the coding part. Mm -hmm. So for PhDs, we will focus more on the public part of the research because you are PhDs, right? So PhDs, we are not expecting a PhD. Are we extremely good at uh, software development. But for masters, we will require a kind of balance between those two because masters is somewhere in between. So about uh, the, uh, if you are a PhD, so I think the internship requirement will be more on your research side. For example, your research topic aligns with a particular team. For example, my team will be on computer vision. So if you have uh, some research I say your thesis is about action localization of self supervised learning, those kind of particular topics that will be considered as uh, uh, strongly related. If you are a master's, so I think the interview will be more uh, resolved around uh, first uh, the coding test. And then if you have any relevant uh, products, because we usually, we, as an experienced, uh, let's say, person in the hiring process, we will know that for masters, it's very difficult to have a decent publication. So we will more focus on what you did, your product. Or uh, what, what do you mean by like the like web project or, or something else? So you're a master, are you a master student? Yeah, I'm a master student, yes. So for example, uh, the, <coughs> the thing will be, did you have the chance to work with any professor to work on the uh, deep learning related products? Mm -hmm. And- uh, uh, No, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. In that case, you probably want to talk with some of the professors. I think mm -hmm. that would be the easier way to get, uh, to gain some experience. Like I mentioned mm -hmm. here. So usually the job requirements will require to have some experience unless so you are okay with the pure programming level internship. Because you mm -hmm. see, especially in recent time, I think a lot of the companies are more focusing on the product. For example, I say, if those companies are doing uh, cloud-based uh, uh, development, they will have some requirements, maybe uh, for example, the Java front-end development or the back-end uh, Python. But you you need to know the backend server to, so that you can set up the uh, basically let's say more close to a full stack developer plus a little bit of deep learning. If that's not a research focus role, but mm -hmm. for research focus role, so mm -hmm. they will be, basically we will require we expect the candidate to let's say know uh, have a deeper understanding of deep learning. For example, let's say have you ever trained a deep learning model? So can you explain the basic uh, uh, mechanism behind uh, vision transport, like the mm -hmm. one I just mentioned? Yep. This kind of thing. Of course, my experience are more on the computer vision side. For, mm -hmm. you know, for NLP, I think the coding part will be similar because the products are similar because whatever they do, they have put it on the cloud or on the smartphone. So those requirements are the same. But I think the research mm -hmm. topic will be a little bit different. The question may be, let's say, can you explain BERT? So how does it work? And I think the transformer is a common part because transformer was originally designed for NLP. So they will also expect you to know, have some in-depth knowledge of, well, let's say, 
uh, what was the original form of the transformer and what make it so efficient? This kind of question. I see. Thank you. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, Peng, did you have your email address on the front slide, on the first slide here? So uh, I think you can check on uh, my website. Yeah, I have my email on the website. Okay. Yeah. So if Lei would like to reach out to you, you're, you know, make sure that yeah. uh, you, he can get your email address so you can reach out to you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So thanks, uh, Peng, for the presentation. It was very informative. And um, I guess we'll call it a, we'll call it a night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, guys. So thank you. Thanks, Lei, and uh, have a good evening. Thanks again, Pei. Peng. And we'll, this will be Bye. this video will be posted on the IEEE Toronto uh, YouTube channel probably within a week. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Bye.